<laughs> this is my husband's desk I borrowed so that I could see multiple monitors at the same time. There we go. So um, this is a teaser for, um, you guys are obviously interested in the topic or you wouldn't be here, but if you have friends that are not, what would your favorite surf break be like if it was always high tide? How many fewer barrels would you get? <laughs> so that is one of the side effects of climate change. Um, I'm gonna kind of go back to basics. And just cause not everybody has a really strong science background, Sometimes people get confused about when they do good things for the environment. They'll be like thinking that they are somebody who really cares about climate change and wants to make a difference. And maybe they're not using plastic straws or they're buying local organic produce and they feel like, yeah, I've done my bit. And the goal of this is to help you see that all those, those types of things are really important and really good. They don't help with this particular problem. They help with other problems, but they don't help with this one. In order to help with climate change, we've got to do something to balance the carbon cycle that we've kind of set out of whack. So I'm going to kind of go back to basics and talk a bit as we go through kind of um, what's going on, go through the concepts of the carbon cycle to, as a refresher. So here we have an image that this is the atmosphere. And the atmosphere is just all the gases that are held to Earth by gravity. And when we look up at the sky, it feels like, you know, it just goes on forever. And it doesn't really matter what we put out there because it's so big. But actually, almost all of the gases that are held to Earth are in the first 10 miles. So a fast runner could run that in less than an hour. So it's really not infinite, which is why we can change it and pollute it if we put out, you know, enough stuff. And most of the atmosphere is made up of nitrogen and oxygen. It's just a small amount of trace gases that are what we call our greenhouse gases. And the greenhouse gases, they all have in common that they're kind of complex molecules. They all have three atoms or more. And what happens with those ones is that the energy comes in from the sun. I don't know if you can, I, I talk with my hands, but I'm so close. <laughs> Anyways, the energy comes in from the sun, hits the surface of the earth, and it turns into heat radiation. And the heat radiation as going back out towards space, when it hits greenhouse gases, these larger, more complex molecules, it makes them vibrate. And they hold on to some of that heat energy. And so that's why um, we call them greenhouse gases because they keep that energy in. And they are what makes life on Earth possible. If you think about the moon, it's the same distance from the sun. And at night, the dark side of the moon is so cold, it can't support any life like we know it on Earth right? It goes down to like negative 240 degrees. So in order to have life on earth, we need those greenhouse gases, but we have been changing the concentration and carbon dioxide, even though it's not the only greenhouse gas, it's the one we focus on because it's what's kind of forcing the change. It's the main driver of the change. And so since the industrial revolution started, based on our activities, now we've got over 40% more carbon dioxide. So when we had a certain amount that was holding in, you know, a certain amount of heat, now we're holding in a little bit more. And the reason that's a big deal is because the temperature of the earth is what has allowed life as we know it, including people, to kind of flourish. And so when you change it, it impacts us. So this is going back to the carbon cycle. Again, we've got our CO2 in the atmosphere. And basically, it would be great if we could suck it out. We do not have technology to suck it out because it's such a tiny percent of the gases up there. But luckily, there is technology. It's just not ones that we invented. Basically, all the plants and trees doing photosynthesis all the time, they are sucking CO2 out of the air for us. And then when animals eat the plants, the carbon gets into them, right? So we get carbon going into the plants, going into animals, and it goes back up into the air when we breathe, when we decompose, or when we burn. And that's kind of our cycle, our carbon cycle. And um, it's been super balanced for a long time. But you can see this is a video in Brazil, and it's showing that one of our big carbon sinks where we store a bunch of carbon is in our forests. It's not just in the wood and the trees, it's also in the soil. About half of it's in the soil under the forest where all that organic matter sits before it rots eventually to go back into the air. 
And this kind of deforestation you see, this is um, basically all done to um, create land, open land for cattle grazing, right? And this is all mostly meat for export. So this is a way that we, from a distance, contribute to this deforestation if we buy the beef. Um, but it's not just places like Brazil that are cutting down their trees. Right here on Oahu, we are actually losing a lot of our canopy as well. And so there's, um, you know, they have studies where they do aerial, basically aerial photographs and measure the amount of tree coverage. And it's a lot of individual small acts of people building more housing on their, you know, within their yard and taking out trees. There's also some areas where there is a, a development where they clear cut a little forested area. So between all of that, here in Hawaii, we're also doing that. And all this deforestation is basically taking the carbon that used to be stored in those trees and putting it into the atmosphere. So that's kind of part of what is changing our atmosphere. The other thing that's happening is that sometimes all this living stuff, organic matter, that has carbon in it doesn't get a chance to burn or rot. It gets covered up with water, compressed, pressured for thousands of years, and on land that becomes coal. When that happens in the ocean to um, basically usually algae, marine algae, that's what became natural gas and oil. And we call all those fossil fuels because they're fossilized, because it took thousands of years. And all of that has been this big carbon sink that has kept that carbon out of our small, fast cycle and you know, stuck in the ground for a long time. When we take that coal or gas or oil out of the ground to use it and burn it, we're putting that carbon into the cycle. So we're kind of adding carbon into the fast cycle. So between deforestation and burning fossil fuels, we're adding the amount of carbon that's cycling around um, between living things and the atmosphere and the ocean. So here is a little graph, and this is not a projection or something like that. This is just observed data, measurements from Mauna Loa, where they have been, since the late 50s, they've been measuring the amount of carbon dioxide in the air. And the little squiggles you see, that's just seasonal. Every winter when you know the foliage um, dies back, you have less, um, there's less carbon that's stored in living things and more of it's in the air. And every summer when the plants take it in, there's a little bit more in the plants and less in the air. So that's what the squiggles are, but you can see the steady increase and that is just our, basically our deforestation and our fossil fuel emissions adding to the amount of CO2 we see in the air. Okay, the third place that interacts in this carbon cycle is the ocean. And the ocean is actually a huge sink, much more than living things and much more than the atmosphere. And the, the way carbon gets from the atmosphere into the ocean is through diffusion. It just means that there's a higher concentration in the air, it'll go into the surface of the ocean, the top 2%. And if there's a higher concentration there, which there hasn't been recently, it would go the other direction because nature likes a balance. And so you have carbon dioxide diffusing into the ocean, You've got a cycle going on in the ocean that is a lot like on land because there's a lot of living things in the ocean. So all the marine algae and plankton and stuff, they're also doing photosynthesis. And when they die, some of them will go down to the bottom of the ocean as marine sediment, and that carbon will stay in the ocean as a sink. The other thing that goes on in the ocean with carbon is that our shelled creatures and coral that builds their hard structures, they use carbon right from the water. They take that and they combine it with calcium to build their structures. Just like our bones are made out of calcium and phosphate mostly, they're using carbon and calcium. So all of that is in their skeletons and the coral skeletons in the shell. And when they die, that goes down to the bottom of the ocean and becomes sediment, becomes, um, eventually becomes rock or limestone. And about 80% of the carbon in the Earth's crust that's stored away in this big carbon sink and not in the cycle is in limestone. The other 20% is our fossil fuels. So that is the way it works in the ocean. And this is to show you, this is to show you the diffusion that I just talked about. The red line is the same graph we saw before. That's just the measured carbon dioxide in the air. The green line, which follows it pretty perfectly, that is the carbon dioxide in the, in the water, in the ocean water. And that's also local data that's from a place about 100 miles north of Oahu. 
So you can see that since we started tracking that, it has been a very steady increase that matches what's in the air because of that diffusion. Now the blue line on the bottom, that is gonna be our first impact. You know, till now I've kind of been talking about what's going on, the causes, and now our first impact, that blue line is showing the pH of the ocean. And as the pH goes down, that means it's getting more acidic, which is super counterintuitive, but that's how we measure pH. So the lower it gets, the more acidic, and you can see there's a really strong relationship. As we get more CO2 in the water, the ocean becomes more acidic. So that's the first impact. And what happens when it gets more acidic is I'm sure, have you guys all heard of ocean acidification? Just give me a little, raise your hand if you have. Has anyone made you go through the chemistry? Yes, somebody. Okay, so this is, um, it's a little bit complicated, but it is not that you can kind of understand. So basically, when you get more CO2 coming into the H2O, the H2O and the CO2 combine to form carbonic acid, which is a very mild acid and it's naturally occurring. But acids are by definition unstable and they release H ions. The H is what you measure when you measure pH, right? And so what happens is when you have a lot more hydrogen ions floating around in the water, they compete with the calcium ions that are trying to form calcium carbonate which these corals and shelled creatures use to make their structures, they outcompete, uh, they get outcompeted. And so the hydrogen ions instead bind with the carbonate. And so the um, coral structures and the um, creatures that build shells, they end up having very thin shells or being slightly deformed, things like that. It's hard for them to build their shells. And when you get into a very extreme situation, and these images are not real world. This is an experiment um, that is using levels of acidity that are predicted maybe at the end of the century. But when it gets more acidic, what, what happens is the higher concentration of those um, hydrogen ions, they actually break up existing calcium carbonate molecules, break them apart, and that is what is dissolving, right? That's when acids dissolve things, that's what they're doing. They're breaking up chemical bonds. So this is something that we worry about in the future. And this, the images here, this is of a sea butterfly. And a sea butterfly is a tiny creature. It's about the size of a pea. And it is at the base of the food chain. And there's a lot of plankton also that have little shells. And they're at the base of the food chain. And when you have things at the base of the food chain that are affected, obviously it affects everything going up the food chain. And we are at the top of the food chain. And there's a lot of people that depend on fish and marine life for their, you know, for their livelihood. So this will be an issue in the future for sure. All right, so we're going back. So we know that we've got more carbon dioxide, more greenhouse gases, so we're holding in more heat and the temperatures are getting hotter. And this is kind of a visual color coding of average annual temperatures over a little more than a hundred years to see this kind of steady change in temperature. These are global averages. And all it means when we see that the temperature is going up, that's why we called it global warming, right? It just means the globe's getting hotter. But we stopped calling, talking about global warming and we started talking about climate change because we found out that there's a lot more going on. So these three countries here that I've just um, shown you, they are all countries that are right on around the equator. And you can kind of see how they have been getting warmer over time. But when you look at two countries that are much further north, this was as close to the poles as I could get data for, they started getting warm much earlier and they have gotten a lot warmer. Now it doesn't mean that they're hotter than the equator because the colors are comparing them to historical temperatures, right? Not to each other. So they have been warming much more quickly at the poles. The poles have been warming much more quickly than the equator. And the reason this is such a big deal is because the difference in temperature between the equator and the poles, that difference is what drives our major weather patterns. So basically the hot air rises and the cooler air rushes to fill it. And that is what causes these, um, these big cycles that we have in the Northern and the Southern hemisphere the, um, our air currents. And so one of those is what causes our trade winds. And you guys may have noticed that we have a lot fewer trade winds now than we used to. 
And that's because those, the difference in temperature between the poles and the equator is no longer creating that super steady, faster cycle that, it, that used to be there. Now it's getting more wobbly and slower. And whatever happens above the water impacts what happens beneath the water as well. So those winds that are going on on top of the water push the water and they create the currents because the, um, the water moves and builds up in the same direction that the wind is blowing. And these are called gyres. And they occur, you know, two different directions, one on top of the equator, one, one on the bottom. And it's a big deal that these have slowed down, uh, not just because of our trade winds, but this is showing coral bleaching. And what happens when they slow down is it takes longer for that cool water from the Northwest to get to Hawaii. And when it takes longer, by the time it gets here, it's a lot warmer. And when it's warmer, warmer water stresses out the coral. And when it gets stressed out, it releases the algae that it's in its tissues. We don't know why, but it does. It becomes toxic for the coral, so it releases it. And that algae is what gives it its color, which is why we call it bleached, because it loses its color. But that algae also provides about 90% of the coral's energy. So it basically starves to death without that algae. Um, when there is a coral bleaching event, if it cools down pretty quickly, the coral can recover which is great. But here in Hawaii, we've had two massive coral bleaching events already. Usually happens around August, September. And we're, we're expecting that to be a, you know, a continuing trend. All right, another change in the ocean we have caused slightly different cause um, is our global conveyor belt. This image is of our global conveyor belt. And it's basically this wild thing where very cold, deep ocean water moves around the oceans and the planet. And it's important because that deep cold water is much more nutrient rich than our shallow warmer water at the surface. So the upwelling and movement takes those nutrients to the surface where there's a lot more marine life that can take advantage of them. So this is again really important for people that, that eat fish as well as the marine life just in their own right. And the way that this is, uh, works is that when sea ice forms, basically ice doesn't have salt in it, even if it's frozen salt water, what happens is the salt gets left behind. So under the sea ice, the water is saltier, extra salty, which means it's extra heavy and it sinks down. And that's what starts this whole motion. So when we don't have that much sea ice forming, we don't get as dramatic uh, you know, a kick to get this global conveyor belt moving. So that is, an, again, an issue for marine life. All right, so this is something I'm sure you guys have all been aware of a lot of floods recently, and people often talk about how they're caused by climate change, and not any one particular storm or flood could be attributed to climate change, but the fact that they're so much more frequent now and that they're more intense that your 500 year or 100 year storms are happening every year, right? That is attributed to um, climate change. And so what's going on? Why do the warmer oceans, because when the air is warmer, the ocean also gets warmer, why do they cause heavy rain floods? The one thing is what we just talked about, the weaker atmospheric currents means that things aren't moving as quickly, right? We don't have our, um, our major wind patterns that keep a storm moving quickly through an area. So it might just sit and dump in one spot more than it used to. The other thing is that warmer water evaporates faster. So you get more evaporation over the ocean. And when you have more evaporation that gets into that passing storm, when it hits land and it breaks, there's just more water to be dumped. Um, you'll also get stronger winds due to the low pressure core that's created in the middle. And then the fact that your sea levels are a little higher means that when there is a storm surge, it might go inland a little further. So those are some of the things we're seeing, um, you know, why those storms are made more frequent or more intense by a warming ocean. Okay, now the funny thing is we blame our floods on climate change, and then we turn around and we blame our droughts on climate change. And so how can those both be, right? So, the reason is that, well, we just talked about, it's the warmer ocean that causes our, our, um, 
a lot of our flooding issues. But for droughts, it's more about the um, some of the changes in the timing of the of the water that gets gets put in places. So in some places, instead of um, snow, they're getting more rain because it's warmer. So they're having mild winters. And when they have the snow, that snow gets stored there. And then it gets spread out. So you still have that water in their system going much deeper into the dry season in the summer. So that's one reason. When it's rain, it, it flows down the rivers right away. So it doesn't stay in that local, local ecosystem. The other thing is that snow will melt earlier. And again, that's a matter of it not staying in the local East Coast system. So it's already melted and it's washed out earlier in the year when they still have to go through the long, hot summer, right? So it doesn't last as long. And then when it is summer, you'll get, because it's hot, you'll get increased evaporation. And you'll also have increased transpiration for the trees trying to keep themselves cool. So that will just be a way that you're, again, just losing water from the system. And obviously when we have droughts, then it's the perfect conditions for wildfires. So that's why we've been seeing so many more wildfires because it's hot, which wildfires like, and everything is so dry. All right, so our last thing that we're gonna look at as you know, kind of an impact on the ocean or climate change is sea level rise. Now, one thing that's super intuitive is all those melting glaciers because it's warmer and our melting ice caps when they melt, all that water has to go somewhere. So it's going into the ocean, which like a bathtub would you know, rise a little bit. But the other reason that we have sea level rise and about a third of it is accounted because there's thermal expansion. So basically the water is warmer, which means the molecules get busier and it actually expands a little bit. So those are the two things together that are causing our sea level to rise. And this is data for um, Honolulu. So it's local data and you can see it's really not super dramatic. Um, the sea level rise, the, the oceans are not a bathtub. They're actually pretty lumpy. So some places are experiencing a lot more sea level rise than we are here in Hawaii right now. So we're fortunate, but it is very steady going upward. So we know what direction it's heading. And the real kicker is not on your average day. When it's a problem is when we have a very high tide, a king tide, that king tide is even just a little bit higher. Or when we have a storm surge, like we talked about before with the flooding, the storm surge will go inland a little bit further. So that's what we see. And so as a result, we're seeing a lot of erosion um, on Oahu, especially on the North Shore or the Northeast Shore. Um, we're seeing tons of erosion because of that storm surge being a little bit stronger and going in a little bit further. Um, okay, so what can we do about it? It sounds like pretty bad news, huh? Um, fortunately, we are not helpless. Um, the beautiful thing is, since it's a man-made problem, we can also find man-made solutions. If this was something that was just coming out of nowhere and we had no control over it, we would really be in trouble. But it's something that we caused, so it's something that we have the potential to undo, which is great. So the most important thing you can do is to vote green. Um, it really makes a big difference. The solutions are, these are big problems and they need big solutions. So it really has to happen at the government level. And sometimes you may be easy to know who to vote for like in the national election for the president, but all the different local things, there's so many different offices and it's hard to keep track who has a time. And the answer is the Sierra Club has a time. So the Sierra Club puts in a lot of effort into interviewing candidates for everything, for OHA, for city council, for every different office and you can go to their website political action and since it's all voting by mail you can take a look and you can see you know who who has a better environmental track record the other thing you can do and right now the legislature is not in session but when it's back in session is you can testify for bills on renewable energy and bills that support tree planting and it does um, my organization healthy climate communities um, it's not our main focus this year, but some years, like we worked really hard to get 100% renewable power passed, and we worked really hard on renewable transportation. And uh, now some of those bigger issues have already kind of been passed. We do track usually, well, we track a lot of bills, but we try to get um, community letter writing going for a couple bills each year. So you can find on my website the um, bills that we were supporting this year with the community. 
And whether it's through healthy client of communities or any other way, um, writing letters does make a difference. It's no guarantee, but it's awfully easy for legislators to ignore something that has no community support. But when they have 200 letters sitting on it, even if they don't have time to read them all, they realize that they're there and they, they, um, they take note. Um, the other thing we can do is we are so lucky to live in a prosperous place. Uh, and that means by being, just by virtue of being Americans, we have a really high, big carbon footprint. And because we have that big carbon footprint, that means we have something we can do. If we were a very, you know, if we lived a very, very simple, poor lifestyle, we wouldn't be able to do much, right? But because we um, are in a place where we, we use a lot of stuff and services, we can make changes. So this is, um, this shows an average American personal footprint. So you can kind of see the different things that we, um, that make it up. So like driving is a big part, our home energy needs. Then over here we have our, um, basically stuff, stuff we purchase. At the bottom is our food. And then on the right in the green, that's services. And it's hard to know where to start, but if you look at this, um, over half of the footprint is just these items. So if we were to be able to focus on just driving our home energy use and basically cow products, we would really get a long way towards, you know, we cut our footprint very dramatically. So sometimes it's hard to know where to start. You wanna make sure when you make a big effort, you're gonna get a big bang for your buck. And if something's super easy, even if it doesn't make a big difference, then go for it. But um, these are kind of the big issues. So if you think about, um, you know, I don't know what everyone's driving situation is, but it's possible that this COVID epidemic will help a lot with uh, uh, not commuting. <laughs> it's certainly helping right now. And to the extent that people get used to not commuting and not having to be do as many face-to-face -face meetings and always be there in person, that could be a real help for our driving situation. Obviously, electric cars are the way to go in the future, especially if they are powered by renewable energy. So these are, these are some things to think about. And none of it is zero sum. It's not like you have to become vegan, but every time you choose chicken teriyaki instead of beef teriyaki, you just lowered your carbon footprint. You know, every time you choose to make the effort to carpool instead of drive by yourself, you just lowered your carbon footprint. So there's a lot of really practical things that we can do to reduce our footprint. And we're lucky to be able to do that because there are places where, you know, I think of the tropical islands like Kiribati and stuff, where people don't even have electricity and they are going underwater, right? Their whole island is going underwater. They have to move and they weren't even part of the problem. So that is super sad. All right, and the last thing we can do is plant trees. So here's an image of some seventh graders who raised this little koa seedling um, from a seed and came and planted it at my project site. And uh, in general, right, we, we have a, uh, an island of, I wouldn't say tree haters, but boy, they get a lot of calls at the city to cut down trees because of rubbish they drop or because they block their view and people on their own property will cut down trees to build more. Um, so we don't seem to be, as much as people say they like trees, we're not seeing that, you know, the value of trees um, reflected in people's actions. So yeah, planting trees or protecting trees even, even better is to protect mature trees that already exist is a really great way to go as well. And so that is the end of what I kind of had prepared for you guys, but I wanted to open it up to questions and discussion. And if you don't have questions about this, you can talk about COVID because I have a public health background. <laughs> Go ahead, you guys can unmute. Hi, uh, it's such a small group, we can just chat. Okay, so um, I, I work normally on the corner of Yang and Kiikoi, which is just this concrete jungle. It's very mm -hmm. hot, and the sidewalks there, there's no greenery whatsoever. And so I was thinking this is a beautification idea for the city to rip out some of that cement and plant trees along there. 
It would add shade. It would add beauty. It would make it much more desirable. I mean, right now it is just an ugly area. I, I am with you. I, I'm actually uh, a founding board member of an organization called Trees for Honolulu's Future. And I wish I could say that we've transformed Honolulu, but we haven't. <laughs> but the goal is we've been working. Um, the first step has been to get the different city agencies talking to each other so that, you know, Department of, of Transportation is actually talking to the Division of Urban Forestry and stuff like that when they make decisions to just take out trees, for example, instead of seeing if they can save them. But yeah, the goal, there's, especially in a place like that, the benefits of a single tree are so crazy big because as temperatures rise in places like that that have a lot of concrete, you get the heat island effect, right? Basically all the sun that, you know, all the heat from the sun gets absorbed and stored in the concrete and then re-radiated out. And so you'll actually get temperatures that are several degrees higher than a place that's not all concrete. And trees can totally change that dynamic and they can make it more walkable. You know, um, you can start a virtuous cycle where people will want to be outside and will want to walk and bike because there's shade. So I'm with you on that. And, um, and you, could, you could contact Trees for Honolulu's Future and, uh, and let them know that you have a spot in mind. <laughs> okay. um, but it, it is, the Division of Urban Forestry is definitely fighting an uphill battle. The mayor made this big commitment to planting, I think, 100,000 trees over a five-year period, but there was no increase in the budget for trees. It was supposed to just happen magically. <laughs> so, you know, you, you can't make those kinds of commitments. There's costs involved in planting, maintaining a tree, especially in an urban area like that. You've got to keep it pruned, otherwise it's a hazard and liability. So... Um, it, it needs to have a budget to go with it. And people demanding that helps those kinds of things happen. It helps the commitment. It makes it easier for politicians to commit when they think people really care. So do you think contacting the mayor's office and is the word is a good place yeah, to Yeah, you know, um, it, it couldn't hurt, yeah. It, you, the, you can also, you could contact the mayor's office. You could also CC um, the Division of Urban Forestry if you look that up online, and you know, it couldn't hurt. Um, we're and trying also, to get a program. Oh, sorry. I was just gonna say, I know also that the Office of Climate Change, um, Office of Climate Change, Sustainability and Resiliency under the mayor's office um, has in, uh, increasing tree canopy cover as one of its biggest priorities. So I know that office works hand in hand with the mayor, so it's worth, reaching out to the different stakeholders, but I'm glad you're looking out for new spots, Arlene. <laughs> yeah, no, it is, um, but that is part of like the mayor's plan. Like they want to count all existing trees. Like they keep wanting to get all my tree numbers to add to their goal. Cause I plant thousands of trees and I'm like, hey, just taking credit for everyone else's trees is not the same as investing, you know, as a city investing in trees, right? So, um, but hearing from, from community members does make a difference, for sure. Anybody else have a suggestion or question? Um, I didn't have a, necessarily a suggestion just for that, um, but I did wanna ask, you said that you deal with climate education in schools. Um, mm -hmm. I personally think that's a great way to spread awareness at such an early level, because that's like when kids are the most excited about these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just curious, like, what's your experience with that? And, like, um, has it been difficult to get into schools? Is it difficult to, like, implement that? Or, like, is there any progress in the DOE to try to implement these things? Or um, It's been, it hasn't been super hard to get into schools. Um, interestingly, it's easier to get into private schools and charter schools. The DOE schools, um, a lot of times the teachers are super stressed out about meeting their requirements. And they right. don't want, they're like, oh, my God, I don't have time for anything extra. Um, but I have done a lot of workshops in schools. And what I, um, what I learned doing those workshops, even though I'm tailoring them sometimes for little kids, you know, I'll do anywhere from like fourth grade through high school, um, is that it'll be the adults in the room, the teacher, teacher's aide, librarian, whoever will come up afterwards and be like, oh my God, I never really got that. 
And so I realized they can't teach this stuff because what they learn about climate change, even if they're very environmentally conscious and they're very concerned about the issues, what they learn is from news articles. So they don't have like a big holistic picture of how things interact and they don't feel comfortable teaching it. So I made um, this last year and a half, we did a big effort to create curriculum for schools for teachers to use themselves. And we did one for fifth grade, one for middle school, and one for high school biology, one for high school chemistry, because the new, they're transitioning this year supposedly, which just didn't really happen. I'm more, an understanding more about the DOE. When they say it's happening this year, it doesn't mean it's happening this year. It means it's starting, it's a gradual process. But they're supposed to, um, transition to something called NGSS, which is Next Generation Science Standards. And it's a much, it's a different way of teaching. The more I learned about it, I really like it. Um, it's much more inquiry based, but it's a really hard thing for teachers to make that transition. All their stuff they've taught historically has got to go out the window and they've got to rewrite curriculum. So I tried to make really local Hawaii based curriculum um, in some cases, it lends itself to being very, you know, kind of culturally Hawaiian. In other places, it's just more the examples are, are relevant to people that live in Hawaii. And um, stuff that would exactly, exactly meet their standards that they're supposed to teach. So that it couldn't be considered extra or enrichment, but it would just be what they're supposed to teach. And I've had a hard time getting it into schools. I have gotten it into some schools, but I was hoping that teachers would just be like, oh my gosh, great, this is already made for me. There's workbooks and, you know, teacher's guide and videos and, you know, everything's all done. And I found it a slower process. And I think part of that is that the teachers didn't actually feel a huge rush to transition to NGSS. I thought they were gonna be scrambling to like do it this year but I think it's more of a, a slow transition. So I have done a lot of training. I trained probably about 200 teachers last year and, um, you know, and hoping that a lot of them use it. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Is everyone staying safe with COVID? Are you social distancing? Mm -hmm. Well, I have been working from home for a while now. Yeah, so I say yes, I'm getting antsy. <laughs> yeah, it's hard. Now, are, are you guys surfers? or Is that why you're part of the Surf Rider Foundation or are you just ocean lovers? Uh, I've done a little surfing. My son's a big surfer and um, I, I'm always in the water. Yeah, it's a yeah, bit I of think, both. <laughs> yeah, I think we have a mixture yeah. of people in here. Yeah, because I found that, I mean, the surf has been great. <laughs> so if you're a surfer, you can still get out and the surf has been phenomenal of late. So that's helped, that's helped my family a lot with, with the stay at home stuff. There's been a fair amount of debate about, I still surf, but there has been a fair amount of debate about ocean water. And I think people who are a little bit worried are like, oh, it could, there's a possibility it could transmit through fecal matter in the ocean. So like after a big rain or something like that. So it seems quite unlikely to me. I even checked with our blue water task force coordinator who has a PhD in water quality. And he said, it's definitely possible, but highly unlikely. So I wanted to know if you had any thoughts on that debate. Um, I do. I think that we might have sewage going into the water. You shouldn't surf anyways, right? Yeah. Because even though COVID seems unlikely, staff and MRSA is very likely, right? We do have some places with really dirty water. And sadly, one of my favorite areas to surf on the South Shore is pretty dirty. Um, like all like by Alawana Bulls, that whole area is, you know, because the Alawai comes out there. And also I think that people, they have, um, it's one of the few harbors in Hawaii where they allow people to live aboard on their boats. And I think they just empty their, you know, basically their waste into the water. They don't bother to go and pump it out. So that's a pretty dirty area. And, um, but I think that um, I, I'm not more worried about infection from COVID than I ever have been with other things, um, personally in the water. Um, because in most of the places, there's not really a lot of sewage going into the water. Mm -hmm. Got it. 
Cool. We still have about 15 minutes. Okay, Caitlin, I see a hand. So go ahead. Hi. Um, so in terms of most of us are taking remote classes, have you considered doing um, like online curriculum for students and for adults who want to learn more about reducing the carbon footprint? You know, I haven't, I haven't thought about that. I, um, you know, the materials that I put out there for teachers, if they wanted to use it and do online, if, I mean, they're, whatever they're doing, they're doing online. They could totally do that. But I haven't thought about, um, about trying to do that myself. I'm not sure because students are focused on what they're required to take for credit. Um, I don't think they're necessarily looking for extra, but I could be wrong. Yeah, I don't know, would you wanna do extra? Uh, yeah, for this topic. <laughs> I heard that, um, so like for public schools, they actually didn't start school until this week. So they've been off for like three weeks and teachers are just scrambling to try to like re redo their curriculum. And um, I don't know, I just feel bad for public school teachers in Hawaii. They're so underpaid and so stressed out. Like mm -hmm. this must be hard. Yeah, I agree. I think it is hard. And I think it's actually hard for all teachers, even right, private school right. teachers um, had a big adjustment, but they probably had more support in that, in the adjustment. But yeah, it's um, expectations are so high and and it's tough but i do actually know a lot of teachers and um and i i don't know about all regions i, I live in kailua and i do know a lot of teachers here and it seems to be going okay right everybody's zooming and and everybody's bothering them all the time expecting them to be technical experts why isn't this working why isn't that doing that they're like oh my god i don't know but um Luckily, most kids either have access to a computer and, and Wi-Fi or else the schools were able to lend them out, at least in this area. I don't know what the situation is everywhere. Yeah, it's tough, for sure. Mm 